Insurance fraud has hit epidemic levels in the UK. It costs more than £1.3 billion a year. That's nearly £3.6 million a day. Deliberate crashes, bogus personal injuries, even phantom pets. The fraudsters are risking more and more to make a quick killing, and every year it's adding more than £50 to your insurance bill. But insurers are fighting back, exposing just under 15 fake claims every hour, armed with covert surveillance systems. That's the subject out the vehicle. Sophisticated data analysis techniques. <laughs> and a number of highly skilled police units. <laughs> they're catching the criminals red-handed. Just don't lie to us. Instead of getting away with it, more and more of these fraudsters are being claimed and shamed. Today, a car scan backfires when investigators spot the telltale signs. That was definitely a red flag, because if you think that you're trying to advertise a car, trying to sell a car, and you can't sell it, and all of a sudden you make an insurance claim, that's a definite red flag for us. Timelines conflict in a claim for a lost watch. We have a bit of a dilemma here. So we have a claim in which this watch was allegedly stolen, and we have a claim where the same watch is now allegedly damaged. And an absent-minded fraudster gets rumbled when his lies tie him up in knots. The circumstances didn't add up, the train times didn't add up, and quite clearly he did not have a clear version of how this happened. So why would it be where you It has now changed the details. So if you're saying it's when you had policy cover, that's absolutely fine. Yeah but you're now going to need to verify that because you've changed the details. Sports cars can be real head-turners, and if you have the means, then why not? But these high-performance vehicles come with a hefty price tag to match, so it might not come as a surprise to hear that they're being used by some cheats to come up with increasingly inventive schemes to defraud insurers. If you've ever been involved in a serious collision, then you may have been given a courtesy car to keep you mobile until yours is repaired. APU is a company that provides such a service, but as this next case demonstrates, it's just as vulnerable as the insurance companies when it comes to fraud on four wheels. A claimant, a man called Adam Islam, phoned up Accident Exchange to say he'd had a non-fault accident. The circumstances were that he'd taken out his car, it had broken down with an electrical fault, and while he was trying to summon help on his mobile phone at the side of the road, an Audi had come around the corner and lost control and driven into his vehicle. When we first took the claim out for accident exchange, it looked like a straightforward claim. Mr Islam was compensated for the damage to his sporty red car, but that wasn't all he received. There's also the cost of the hire car that we provided and obviously the damage to the ADA one. But Mr Islam uh, achieved a uh, cash settlement in excess of £29,000. So all in, a considerable amount of money. But this wasn't your average car claim because there was more to Mr Islam's car than met the eye. So we knew it day one, it wasn't actually a Ferrari, it was an MR2. However, because of the body kit, uh, it looked like a Ferrari. So if you saw it driving down the road, it would look, for all intents and purposes, like a Ferrari F430. But it was actually a uh, Toyota MR2. Uh, it does happen, you know, people change their cars on a regular basis and put body kits on. Uh, but the industry is well aware that uh, as long as it's insured and you've got a registration number, we can do checks and we can identify quite easily what the original car is. However, the interesting thing was that he got an agreed value with the insurance company. So it was still quite an expensive car in the in excess of £30,000 agreed value is what he thought it was worth and I believe what the insurance company valued it at. So Mr Islam's fake Ferrari had been involved in a crash and he had been supplied with another car to keep him mobile while the claim was processed. But APU soon discovered that one car wasn't enough for Mr Islam. And then we were contacted by one of our partners, Hill Dickinson Solicitors, who gave us some intelligence to say that Adam Islam 
whilst he was in hire with an accident exchange vehicle, was also trying to source another replacement vehicle. And that's one of the flags for the industry to think, if you've got a replacement car, why on earth would you need another one? Why indeed? So APU decided to dig deeper. When we looked into the claim further, uh, and we found from the vehicle, the Toyota MR2 that was dressed up as a Ferrari, had been for sale recently uh, on a well-known website. If you think that you're trying to advertise a car, trying to sell a car, you can't sell it, and all of a sudden you make an insurance claim, that's a definite red flag for us. The warning bells were certainly going off, and they didn't stop ringing. When we looked at the circumstances of the accident, uh, as it was related to accident exchange, uh, Adam Islam had said a, a stranger, somebody he didn't know, had driven their car into the back of his fake Ferrari. APU looked at the other driver, as a gentleman called Mohammed Abu Kaya, uh, and we found uh, some links between him and Mr. Islam. Uh, bear in mind, initially, they'd both said that they didn't know each other. So when we looked at social media, for example, uh, we could see they were linked. We also did some further investigation and found that phone numbers they had used uh, individually were linked to each other. So it was clear at that stage that they did know each other, uh, and it was clear that they were friends. Having discovered that the people involved in this accident were actually friends rather than complete strangers like they claimed, APU investigated further. The vehicle that hit the fake Ferrari uh, was an Audi A1. That was a hire car from a hire company locally to the scene of the accident. It turned out that Mr. Kaya had hired the vehicle, the Audi A1, the very day before the accident, and that again raised our suspicions. Hired a vehicle, and then the very day after, he'd had an accident in it. He'd also taken out all the collision damage waivers as well, which meant that if he had an accident and it was his fault, there'd be very little for him to pay. This case was throwing up more questions than answers. Then APU heard from Mr Islam again. He made another claim to accident exchange to say that he'd driven our car into another vehicle. Now again, that's another uh, red flag for us because he's in a hire car, we're the insured party, we've got the insurance liability uh, and he's making a claim ultimately against us. As far as Neil was concerned, they were dealing with a fraudster and the first course of action was to recover the replacement vehicle that Islam had fraudulently obtained. So my decision was we we're going to snatch the car back. To do that, uh, APU go out, we take the spare key and we re repossess the car. So we physically went to his address and took the car back. By now, APU had the full picture. Rather than being a complete stranger, as Adam Islam had claimed, the driver who had crashed into his fake Ferrari was actually his friend, Mohammed Abu Kaya. And because Kaya was in a hire car, he had next to no liability, whilst Islam submitted a claim for almost £30,000. APU had already snatched back the replacement car it had provided Islam with while his claim was being processed, but that was just the beginning of the action it would take against these fraudsters. So the options for us were either to take civil action or a private prosecution. And we decided to do a private prosecution because uh, that seemed the best thing to do under the circumstances. This for us was a, a deliberate fraud, a deliberate collaboration between two people that were trying to defraud a number of people. So we decided to go down the criminal route and do a private prosecution, something we haven't done before. In this investigation, APU took on the role of the police investigators. Mr Islam was invited in to interview. Um, that was one of our depots. It was video recorded and we offered him the ability to have legal representation, as the police would do uh, during a normal police investigation. Uh, he arrived with his uh, solicitor. We went through the process of disclosing the intelligence and the information to him prior to the interview. Mr Islam was asked a number of questions. That, for me, was his opportunity to provide an explanation around this collision. Uh, he decided, I presume, through legal advice, to offer no comment throughout the interview. So he didn't, uh, he didn't want to give us an explanation at that stage for some reason. The case was assessed by our barrister uh, from Hill Dickinson. Uh, then it was sent to the Crown Prosecution Service. As part of the private prosecution process, we applied to a court and there was a court hearing. Not before time for APU, who, with the help of other companies involved, 
had spent countless hours gathering evidence and a considerable amount of money on the investigation. More than two and a half years after the supposed accident, it's the day of sentencing for Adam Islam and Mohammed Abu Kaya, and Neil has come to Snaresbrook Crown Court to hear the judge's verdict. With a criminal investigation, it's important, essential in fact, that we need all the evidence in front of the judge to make that decision. So hundreds of hours, a lot of money spent, and we're hoping for justice to be done today at the court. And Neil didn't have to wait long as Adam Islam was sentenced to 18 months behind bars. In terms of the sentence today, it's very pleasing that the court has taken this sort of offence very seriously. Islam has been sentenced to 18 months prison, immediate custody. He's been told he'll serve half of that. Kaya has been given a 12 months custody, suspended for two years. He's also been given an order to pay uh, thousands of pounds back, both to Accent Exchange and to the insurance company and to the hire company where he hired the car from. So really pleased with the result. It sends a strong message out to anybody involved in fraud. Later, fancy footwork is the undoing of an opportunist with an eye for compensation. I'm not an expert on, on modern dance, but this guy's moves are just bizarre. It's quite strange to watch. Uh, and it's not the best place to be practicing your dance moves, is it? A moving bus. Bad weather, like storms, gales and torrential rain, can be a recipe for disaster, causing chaos and disruption. One in ten households has made a claim on home insurance policies due to the elements. And whilst the majority of these are legitimate, for some chances, the opportunity to cash in on Mother Nature is just too hard to resist. The damage that extreme weather causes can be devastating and result in a raft of insurance claims. But John Beadle at RSA recalls one case that required really close scrutiny. We had a, a claim for some storm damage. We noted that there had been some torrential rain and a thunderstorm recently. So um, a few broken or missing tiles on the roof seemed a um, perfectly plausible result. So far, so good. But the amount being claimed was a bit of a shock. We were quite surprised to receive uh, a claim for the repair of the roof for £7,000, which seemed to be rather excessive for what appeared to be just a couple of missing tiles from the roof. We sent an adjuster out, uh, and there was indeed some damage to the roof. But rather bizarrely, we also had a claim for a damage to a watch valued at £4,750, uh, which had also apparently been damaged in the storm. What was intriguing and almost fanciful was the explanation of how such a high-end watch got damaged in the storm. You would have thought that perhaps one of the um, tiles falling off the roof might have damaged it, but no, in this instance, it was hanging in a hanging basket in the bedroom, that the bedroom window was open. Uh, the wind blew the basket. The watch fell out and landed on a, a solid object and uh, was damaged. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had a watch worth almost 5,000 pounds, a hanging basket by an open window is quite possibly the last place I would choose to keep it. I can't rule out that the circumstances relating to the damage of watch didn't happen, but the weather wasn't severe, and it seemed rather strange, therefore, that the watch which was in a hanging basket in the bedroom would have been blown about and the watch fell out and be damaged. Unconvinced by the claimant's version of events, the forecast for this claim wasn't looking good. When we dug further into the uh, weather, we found there hadn't been a significant weather event in the area at the time that it was alleged, and therefore we didn't believe that this loss could have happened uh, as it was described. Repairing the broken tiles would have been a um, small amount of money, but of course the repairing the, the, the watch um, would have been considerably more expensive. 
RSA went back to the claimant to see what he had to say. When we tried to speak to the insured in a bit more detail to find out the circumstances of this claim, particularly as we'd actually established that there wasn't particularly inclement weather um, at the period when he alleged this damage was done, he became quite abusive. But eventually when he, he calmed down, uh, he said he, he wouldn't pursue the claim for the damaged roof tiles, but would nevertheless be pursuing the claim for his his watch. I have to say we were quite surprised by that, given the peculiar circumstances surrounding how the watch was apparently damaged. Um, but, but there we were. The claimant's story didn't ring true, and other evidence came to light. With the policyholder determined to push through his claim, RSA set about verifying the details. We asked him to provide um, an invoice for the watch, uh, which he did, but it had no serial number on it, which is unusual for an expensive uh, watch like this. We asked him if he had any other documentation, and eventually he produced a, a repair bill which did have a serial number on it. This number proved to be extremely useful. The serial numbers are unique to these rather expensive watches, and we were able to speak to the manufacturer and establish that indeed this watch did belong to this gentleman. But bizarrely, uh, this watch was actually stolen in a burglary that he had reported uh, some years previously um, and was compensated for by his previous insurer. He'd received £11,000 for that claim, but now the watch had miraculously turned up and was being claimed for again. It raised a very important question. We have a bit of a dilemma here. So we have a claim in which this watch was allegedly stolen, and we have a claim where the same watch is now allegedly damaged. So either the watch wasn't stolen in the burglary, and hence it was still able to be damaged in this occasion, or else um, the watch was stolen originally, and it shouldn't be in existence now to be damaged. Either way, the claimant had completely shot himself in the foot. We clearly weren't going to pay this, this claim in the circumstances as they were presented. Uh, we did inform uh, the other insurers um, that this watch was still in existence and in possession of our policyholder, uh, and they will no doubt be contacting this gentleman to get back the money that they paid out to him uh, for the previous burglary. Our job as insurers is to be here for people in the times of crisis or injury and to speedily and fairly compensate them for the loss or injury they suffered. It's not to pander to people who are being dishonest and, and trying to make money out of insurers to which they're not entitled. Unless you live in the wilderness without a mobile, it's pretty tricky to hide your movements. We're clocked on CCTV, on public transport, and even when we make phone calls. Tickets we buy and receipts all have times printed on them. And it's this kind of detail that can make a real difference when it comes to making an insurance claim. Painstaking effort goes into verifying facts. So if you're making an honest claim, you won't mind the questions. If you're in the shady camp, they may trip you up. At TCS Claims, Simon Powell's team dealt with a customer for whom time really did tell. This was a claim for a lost iPhone from a customer worth around £349. The customer had got off the train and shortly after this realised that he'd lost his phone. As he had a policy in place to cover the phone, the customer called TCS Claims to report his loss. Can I make a claim? Um, I lost my phone. What phone is that? It was an iPhone 7. OK, when, th when did that happen? Um, I lost it today at Just 1 o'clock. Today at what? I was in the gym. Yeah, okay. I was in the gym. I was in the gym. Oh, right, OK. So you definitely had it when you got on the train? Yes. I mean, when I got off, that's when I realised it must have left on the train. 
Based on the information that had been provided, the incident circumstances appeared genuine. You got on the train, did you say at 1 pm? Yes. All right, and this is today? Yes. What train was it? Where was it going to? It was going towards um, Strawberry Hill. Um, I got off here at roughly, it takes maybe sometime half an hour. So all before 2? Yeah, yeah, all before 2, definitely. It was all before okay. 2. So I got, I got the train like 1, 1 45. It was all sounding pretty routine, but there was another check that had to be made. We noted that the incident and the claim had occurred on the day that the policy was taken out. It's fair enough. After all, what are the odds of needing to make a claim just hours after taking out a policy? The timeline is absolutely important. If we receive a claim on the same day that the policy is taken out, we need to absolutely confirm that the policy was taken out before the claim was actually made. But unfortunately for the claimant in this case, the timeline was an issue. The customer reported the claim online and then immediately called us to confirm that he'd lost his phone at one o'clock. In his haste to cover himself, the claimant had opened two policies for his iPhone. During the call, the customer gave the information to the claims handler and it became apparent that whilst the phone was lost at one o'clock, the customer hadn't taken out the policy until 20 past two. This simply means that the policy was taken out after the incident occurred and therefore the lost iPhone was not covered. So two policies had been opened, but the discrepancy over time seemed totally lost on the claimant. You can see that both of these policies started after 2 p.m. today. Mm -hmm. So you lost this phone before you took the policy out, so that's not something that we'd cover. Mm -hmm. So you can't claim for it if you lost it before you had the policy. Yeah. Wait, should we say sorry? You, you can't claim for a phone that you lost before you had the policy, and both of these policies were taken out after 2 p.m. today. After 2 p.m.? Mm-hmm. Wait, so wait, I'm, I'm trying to think, what kind of roughly are you I checked both, just in case, but like I said, both, both of these have been taken out after 2 p.m. today, and the phone's been lost around 1 p.m., like you just said yourself, before 2. I mean, I think you came back to when I got, when I got the chain. I remember I did go on the website and I always had a policy, I remember that. But when I didn't have a policy, I got on the laptop. That's the thing. No, I know, but uh, if you did the policy on your laptop, it was still done after two. So it's been taken out after you've said you've lost the phone, so it's not something we can cover. In this situation, and looking at this specific customer, it actually looked as though they could have been innocent, and it, and it was simply that they didn't understand the fact that they couldn't take out a policy after the incident actually occurred. This is not uncommon in student possessions and gadget cases, and quite often a customer will not realise that they're unable to take out a policy after an incident occurred. However, during the numerous phone calls that followed, Simon's team became increasingly suspicious as the timeline that the claimant had insisted was accurate began to change. When you first answered, you said 1 p.m. and you confirmed 1 p.m. You said no, definitely okay. before no, 2. Okay. I'd have to accept your first answer and you've, you've told me quite no, a lot okay. now that it was before 1 p.m. It was after. If the claimant's revised timings were correct, then fortunately for him, there was an easy way to prove it. At this point, the claims handler asked the customer to provide the train ticket that would support the fact that they were on the train at this particular time. OK, if you have your train ticket, I can verify that. You've got my train ticket? Yeah, if, if you're saying now that it's after, you've obviously changed the details, so we'd need something to verify that. During this call, the customer provided us with a different version of events. The circumstances didn't add up, the train times didn't add up, and quite clearly he did not have a clear version of how this happened. So why did you go to the stage where you want to verify? Because you've now or... changed the details. So if you're saying it's when you had policy cover, that's absolutely fine, yeah. but you're now going to need to verify that because you've changed the details. Unable to provide proof of his timings, the claimant's next move smacked of desperation. The customer became agitated and at this point asked us to cancel both policies in place. Well, it's really just to deter fraud because obviously you can't take out a fraudulent policy to cover a phone that's already been lost. I'm not doing no fraud or anything like that, but it's just the way the way you're talking to me now is like you coming upon a person, you know, coming across is really complicated towards me. 
Well, I, I apologize if you feel like that, but if you, because you've changed the details now, you, if you, you can still make this claim if you're saying it's after 2 p.m. We just need to show, see something that's happened after 2 p.m. If not, I can probably to cancel your policy. There were lots of phone calls to try to resolve this case, but one seemed to clarify the situation. Perhaps the claimant finally realised he wasn't capable of time travel. I lost my phone around one. I could have got a policy when I went home. Did you lose your phone before you purchased the policy? No, I lost my phone before, yeah. Finally, the claimant came clean. So what time did you lose your phone? Let's get this straight. I could have got a policy when I went home. But you went straight home, did you? Yeah, yeah. OK. And I take it off, I then submit a claim form yeah, that home yeah. as well. OK. Yeah. Well, I, honestly, I thank you for being honest with me and coming straight with me about this one. OK, so obviously we can't cover the claim just because it happened before the policy was taken out. Okay. But because you have come honest with, with me now, I, we won't look to sort of prosecute you or report this to the police for fraud at all, OK? You may think he got off lightly, but there will be repercussions. Based on all the information that we've been given, and this related to system access to confirm exactly when the policy had been taken out. We were clear in our own minds that this was not a valid claim. We declined the claim and voided the policy from inception, and the customer would have to disclose this if they take out any future insurance products. So what started as a legitimate claim ended with more lasting consequences for the claimant. We could have taken this further, but we do believe that based on the circumstances that we got the right outcome. Still to come, pet insurers attempt to claw back a claimant's ill-gotten gains. We'd already paid on the first claim, so the policyholder had had money out of us fraudulently, uh, and we needed to get that back. Nearly four and a half billion journeys are made by bus passengers in England each year. For the vast majority of these travellers, a trip on public transport is simply a means of getting to their destination. But for a minority, it can be an opportunity to make a quick buck. Transporting that many passengers means that accidents are inevitable. But sometimes it can be difficult to identify the genuine claims from those that are made by chances simply trying it on. It's something that Ford investigators at Bus Operator First Group have become extremely good at. We received a letter from a firm of solicitors acting on behalf of a gentleman who claimed that he'd been injured uh, whilst travelling on one of our buses. The claimant had told us that a vehicle had pulled out from a side road uh, and the bus had hit it. Um, this had caused him to be thrown around on the bus, uh, causing injuries to his neck and his back as a result of the movement. He was claiming to have uh, sustained soft tissue injuries to his neck uh, and his lower back. Um, the injuries were of a, a moderate nature. He did need to go to hospital, um, so he did seek some treatment for them. The claim made to us was for personal injuries, compensation for those injuries, uh, with the legal costs on top, would have been worth around about five and a half thousand pounds. That's not an insignificant amount, but before parting with any money, First Group wanted to establish the facts, as the claimant's account didn't tally up with that of the driver. The driver's version of the accident circumstances was slightly different. Um, he was saying that he was in the left-hand lane of two, roadworks had forced him to merge to the right, and uh, another vehicle had not given way, so they'd come together. Um, we needed to look at the CCTV to see which version of events was the correct one and whether either of them could have caused the injuries alleged. With numerous cameras on the bus, the footage proved extremely useful and covered all angles. What we're expecting to see um, during the footage is evidence of uh, the movements that would cause the injuries that this guy's alleging, some sort of bracing um, or being thrown forwards and backwards, just to see if we can verify what he's saying is, is true. The CCTV footage doesn't actually verify what he's saying. Um, he does notice that something's happened, but only after it's actually happened, certainly not at the point of impact. He does exactly what the other passengers do and simply looks out of the window. What the CCTV actually shows is that there's no real movement or impact on the bus which has caused him to be injured. In fact, there's a few things you'll notice here. Uh, first, he's standing at all times when there's loads of seats around him. 
fair enough, he's entitled to do that, but if you're sitting, you're less likely to be injured. Um, secondly, he doesn't hold on to anything for virtually the whole of the journey. And uh, third, he's, uh, he's, he's dancing. I'm not an expert on, on modern dance, but this guy's moves are just bizarre. There's some real good sort of sidestep crab moves. Some Elvis-esque leg wobbles. My personal favorite is the standing on one leg and waggling the ankle, which I'm just gonna call the crazy flamingo. Um, it's quite strange to watch. Uh, and it's not the best place to be practising your dance moves, is it? A moving bus. No, it's not the safest thing to do, but Twinkle Toes wasn't remotely interested in sitting on one of the many available seats. At no point does the CCTV show a, a jolt or anything of that nature uh, where these injuries could have been sustained. I can only really put it down to maybe excessive dance moves. Um, from, oh, no, maybe not. In terms of defending this claim, the CCTV was crucial. It just proved that he wasn't paying attention to anything that was going on around him. I mean, Michael Jackson could have moonwalked past him with James Brown sitting on his shoulders, and I don't think he would have even noticed. It'll come as no surprise that this was a claim First Group would not be paying. Having viewed the CCTV footage, um, the next thing we did was just to write back and repudiate the claim. Uh, we advised that we couldn't see anything that had uh, caused an injury or could have caused an injury, and therefore we weren't prepared to make any offers of compensation. We never had any further response or comeback from the claimant, uh, so we can only assume that he's just gone along with what we've said. Based on the evidence that we've got, he didn't really have a choice, did he? Entertaining as it was, the dancer wasted NHS time, that of the driver, and claims handlers. The CCTV proved invaluable. I think there is a general belief that if you go to hospital or seek some sort of medical attention, um, you can use that to rubber stamp or validate your claim. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, even with cases where we've got a medical opinion, if we go back to them with something like CCTV footage, they're quite happy to review what they've said previously. While CCTV does provide us with um, great evidence, uh, it does show that there are dishonest people around there, it does occasionally give us, uh, or give myself, cause to, to smile. I was watching this one expecting to see a traumatic incident and I just see this chancer dancer. Uh, my only hope was that the music providing his rhythm could have been uh, the wheels on the bus go round and round. If you're going to put a claim in and it's going to be dishonest, just remember that your next theme tune could be Jailhouse Rock. The UK is a nation of pet lovers, with around 45% of the population owning some sort of animal. Dogs top the list of favourites, but as adorable as our four-legged friends are, caring for them can be costly. Puppies are particularly vulnerable to accidents, so a pet insurance policy can offer protection if disaster strikes. But it's best to have it in place before you get your pet, as vet bills can be costly. Simon Wheeler of Agria highlights a case where one owner made a real dog's dinner of her claims. So the claim was for a little boy puppy uh, that had broken its leg. The first time we spoke to the policyholder, she called us and advised that the puppy had had an accident and broken its leg the night before. And what happened yesterday? Um, he was out in the garden after dinner and my little grandson tripped over him. Right, OK. And his Winston's actually broken his elbow or something on his leg. OK, when did that happen? Um, yesterday evening, about maybe about five, six o'clock. Right, OK. So it's about six o'clock. Mm. OK. In the first call, the policyholder advised us that the uh, accident had happened the day before, and that was the day that the policy was set up as well. We then heard from her four hours later, and she was much more animated. Uh, she'd been to the vet, uh, and the vet uh, wanted confirmation uh, that the claim was going to be covered before they'd uh, start the treatment. They will be able to go ahead with one operation because the, the kennel club um, can't guarantee payment of the operation or something. What we would advise them is the same thing we would advise you, and that's that we can't guarantee any claims over the phone. Yeah. 
we also let them know, as we would you as well, that anything to be found pre-existing to the inception date, um, to when the policy started, wouldn't be covered. But yeah, well, obviously that's covered because, I mean, the dog broke its leg after the dog was covered, so it doesn't matter. If I insured my car, and five minutes later I walked out and drove my car up the road and I had an accident, I'm still insured. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's like the dog's got a broken leg and I need to get the dog's leg fixed. Right. So I'm, I'm at the situation where I obviously I, want my dog, I don't want my dog in pain. Of but course, yeah. I don't have 2,000 odd pounds that they say that it could cost. As any dog owner will tell you, vet's fees for broken bones can be sky high. So it's no wonder the owner wanted to be sure she was covered. We always have concerns when the policy start time and the accident uh, injury are very close together. But when the veterinary claim form came in and the veterinary records showed that the accident uh, had happened the day afterwards, um, no, there was nothing to worry about. It looked like a completely uh, normal and bona fide claim uh, and it was paid. So, with everything above board, the claim was paid, but this wasn't the last Agria would hear from the policyholder. The next time we heard from the policyholder was when she submitted a second claim, a claim for £530 for x-rays and checkups, uh, just to check the progress of the puppy's recovery. When we assessed the second claim, um, there were some discrepancies uh, from the first claim that came in. The most notable one was the time of the accident. In the first claim, it was six o'clock in the afternoon. When did that happen? Um, yesterday evening, about maybe about five, six o'clock. And on the second claim, 3.45. That had moved much closer to the time that the policy had taken out, which started to ring a few alarm bells. We then asked the vets to double-check their records. When they double-checked, they confirmed that the owner and the pet were in the practice on the day the policy was incepted, at 3.30, only 20 minutes after the policy was incepted. And actually, before the, both the times the policyholder had given, given us uh, for the time of the accident. So this case was looking more complicated than it actually was because of a mistake by the vets over dates. So when the vets completed the first claim form, they mistakenly put the day after the actual appointment as the date of the appointment. The woman's first claim had been paid, but now she'd submitted a second claim for ongoing treatment. Part of the information in this new claim contradicted the details the woman had given for the original accident, so Agria asked the vets to double-check their records. This led to the discovery that the puppy had actually been examined less than half an hour after the policy had been taken out. Unsurprisingly, Agria wanted answers. Presented with this conflicting information, we then went back to the policyholder and we wanted them to confirm in writing the sequence of events. So when the policy was set up, when the accident occurred and when the veterinary consultation took place. We actually had no immediate response to that letter, so we couldn't uh, progress that claim. However, we did hear from the policyholder uh, a while later when she called our customer service team for a, a claim form uh, because she'd be submitting a, a third claim. He's had um, x-rays done on his leg and then just right. for a claims policy. OK. Uh, would you like a claim form emailed over to you? Yes, I would. You... Yeah. OK. When the policyholder called us, we reminded her that there was still outstanding information uh, and queries on the second claim, which we hadn't been able to progress. So that claim form is on the way now to you. Can I just ask, though, we actually yeah. had a claim in 2016 yeah. for £529.90 pence, and it says it's wasting information from the policyholder. Okay. Right. So what we need then is, is a letter just confirming all of the details and then we can progress with that claim for you. A letter? Because yeah. I'm going to write a letter. Right. Um, but fine. certainly the other claim form's on the way for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. When the third claim form was submitted by the policyholder, it was for £697 and it was for a complication that had arisen uh, as a result of the first operation. Um, and one of the screws that had secured the leg had worked itself loose and needed uh, uh, removing. So with the third claim submitted and still queries on the second claim, uh, we ramped up the investigation. 
we started to look more broadly at uh, the puppy and the owner, and if we could determine facts that would enable us to get a clear view of the things that had happened. With three claims now totaling more than £3,000 and serious doubts about their validity, the woman really was pushing her luck. In the pet industry, one of those areas that we can go and look at, given that the puppy was Kennel Club registered, is the Kennel Club database, which will, uh, one, identify the puppy and identify the puppy's owner as well. The information the Kennel Club provided was very enlightening. It showed that although the policy was set up on the 15th of August for the puppy, According to the Kennel Club records, the puppy had actually been sold on the 28th of July and was no longer owned by the policyholder. At its most basic level, what that meant was that the puppy uh, that was being claimed for didn't have a policy uh, of insurance covering it. The bottom line was that this was a clear-cut case of insurance fraud. There were two implications in this case. One was the fact that the accident had obviously occurred before the policy was taken out. More interesting in this case was the fact that the policy of insurance didn't actually cover the puppy in question, so the puppy wasn't insured. Presented with these facts, the second and third claims declined. However, we'd already paid on the first claim, so the policyholder had, had money out of us, fraudulently, uh, and we needed to get that back. So we wrote to the policyholder and offered her the opportunity to repay that money, uh, and we still haven't heard from her. She never responded to queries after her second claim, but she may have struggled to button her lip when she realised the implications of her actions. When we didn't hear from the policyholder, we wrote to her again and advised that if she didn't pay the £2,500 back to us, we would have to pass the debt on to our legal team who would look to recover the debt uh, and any legal expenses that uh, might be incurred on top. Since that last communication, uh, we have passed the case on to our legal team and they are pursuing the debt so they will approach the policyholder uh, for the payment of that £2,500. We've also uh, registered the policyholder on the fraud database, IFIG, and we have uh, suspended her ability to set up free cover for any future litters that she has. So, you know, three things that will uh, materially impact uh, her, world, her, her role in the dog world. None of us likes paying more than we have to for everyday services, but this is exactly what's happening with insurance fraud. Scammers and con men are swindling their way to payouts that they don't deserve. The knock-on effect is that the extra costs result in ever-increasing premiums. We're getting hit in the pocket, and it's not just organised criminal gangs to blame. Exaggerated claims also take their toll. But instead of getting away with it, more and more of these fraudsters are being claimed and shamed. Thank <laughs> you.